And our final reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6, verses 60 to 68. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. These words that I have spoken are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones who did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. In this here, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Loving God, may the meditations of all our hearts that are gathered here today be pleasing to you. May there be more of you and less of me in the words I'm about to deliver. Amen. Now the reading we heard today is surprising in many ways. I find the way Jesus handles the situation a bit confusing because some of the things Jesus is saying are very upsetting. They upset his followers and he seems to, it doesn't seem to make it any easier on them, does he? Now our natural instinct is to take down barriers that are in people's way and to help them get past them. If someone finds something hard to understand, we often want to explain it to them. If someone finds something difficult, we often want to make it easier. If there is something in their way, we want to move it. And we probably expect that Jesus would do all those things as well. But what is surprising is that Jesus doesn't seem to do that in this case. Instead of making it easier to believe, he actually seems to make it a bit harder on them. Instead of opening the door, he seems to put up a barrier. To give you a bit of context uh, about this reading, earlier in the chapter, Jesus has fed the multitudes. God multiplies two fish and five loaves to feed 5,000. Well, probably 10,000 people because they weren't counting women in that 5,000. And then many of those who were there that day followed him because of, they experienced this miracle. They believe in him. It seems to be a perfect opportunity for Jesus to add to the number of people following him. They appear to be on his side. But Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw a miraculous sign, but because you ate loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. He begins gently. He's healed these, this crowd and he's, he's fed them. And now he points them to beyond the immediate, their immediate um, physical satisfaction, uh, their immediate physical needs. And he points to them towards something more eternal and spiritual. He promises to give them the bread of life. But the crowd doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't understand, they don't understand that he's talking about spiritual nourishment, not the physical um, food. Jesus said, The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they respond by saying, Sir, from now on, give us this bread. They still don't seem to understand what he means. And he explains that he is talking about uh, the bread of life. He says, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me 
will never be thirsty. But they still don't get this metaphor um, that they're offered and, and they're offended. They say, uh, it says they begin to, to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread of life who came down from heaven. If they're upset by what he is saying, maybe it's time for Jesus to maybe change his subject or move on to something else. No, not Jesus. He only repeats what he has said. And this adds to the offense that they've felt. He says, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is a bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, the crowd loses it. They go off. They, they blow their top. Now, at this point, we need to understand that the Jews had a, a very strict dietary law they had to follow. There were kosher foods, which were food that was religiously clean and safe to eat. And there were foods that they'd never think of eating because it was unclean. Pork, for example, was one meat that they would never eat because if they did, they would be unclean and wouldn't be able to worship of a synagogue or a temple. Now Leviticus um, chapter 11 in the Old Testament lists uh, what, cl what clean foods are and what unclean foods were to the Jewish people and it's quite a list. All animals with divided hoof is unclean. Camels, rabbits, uh, camels and rabbits even though they didn't have a divided hoof are unclean. All things that live in the water but do not have scales or fins are unclean. Birds are unclean. And the list goes on. But and then there's cannibalism, which is something else altogether. So when the Jewish um, so so when the Jews heard that Jesus said he was the bread of life, and he was talking about his flesh, that really offended them. They say, How can this man give us flesh to eat? Now probably another good time to, to change um, subjects or, or move on at least backpedal a bit no nah, not Jesus he makes it worse by saying I tell you the truth unless you eat the flesh of a son of a man and drink his blood you have no life in you whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and will and I will raise them up at the last day for my flesh is the real food and my blood is the real drink whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them whoa <laughs> hold on buddy but if we were actually part of this culture and in that crowd if somebody said to you eat my blood eat my flesh and drink my blood you would have completely lost it too I reckon it would have been astounding. It would have had such a big impact on us and we would have been confused and, and outraged, I bet. Actually, the early church was accused of cannibalism because of a Eucharist. Now, we know that that's a huge misunderstanding of what the Eucharist is. But when Jesus said this to the crowd, it was the first time anybody had said anything like that. And if you read in the original language, the Greek in the New Testament, you realize that the words Jesus chooses makes things even worse. He changes the verb. Earlier, when he's reading about uh, eating flesh, he uses the word for eat, simply for eat, estio, which just means to eat. But in verse 54 and onwards, he uses the verb trogo, which not only means to eat but it has a sense of chew and gnaw and crunch like the animals do now they were the the crowd was already offended and this ma this statement makes it even worse and more offensive by using that word then the bible says that people said to each other this is a hard teaching who can accept it and that makes sense when you know what jesus is doing with the language there 
And, and many of his disciples turned their backs on Jesus and no longer followed him. The question is, why would Jesus do that? Why would he make it so hard? He obviously knew that he was causing offence to these people and creating a misunderstanding. He lost many disciples. Now, the loyalty of the twelve apostles looks shaky at this point too. Jesus actually addresses them and says, You don't want to leave as well, do you? So why did Jesus put up these barriers to people's faith um, instead of removing barriers? Instead of opening a door, he seems to slam it in their face. And this is not the only place in the gospel where that happens. Now, I believe Jesus did that because he was interesting, interested in something more than a superficial surface level faith. He wasn't looking for numbers. He wasn't interested in, in filling pews on a Sunday. He was doing something radical in the truest sense of the word. He was doing something nobody had ever done before. He was doing something that was totally against the culture he was living in. He was looking for true disciples. Now, he wasn't looking for fans like um, that rock bands have or who just come to a concert. And he wasn't looking for fans that football teams have, the, the ones that sit on the sideline. Fans who don't think about um, the team until the next week. When what he was doing was looking for true committed followers. It's all too easy to expect God to meet our needs and provide for us like he did for that, that crowd of 5,000 people and never consider what is really important and what he really wants to do in us and for us. And even what response he expects from us. Now, when we're faced with the hard challenges in Scripture, and, and there are many hard challenges in Scripture, Jesus always challenges us to think and reflect and consider what the actual cost of being a follower of Christ is. He will actually take the chance um, that our faith... He, he, He'll take the chance that our faith will grow. Uh, we may be offended and, and leave, but he'll take that chance that our faith will grow instead of us turning our back on him. And he'll do that at the expense of, of our comfortable position before we met him. We have to move from the place of, of faith a superficial face, faith to, to a place of true discipleship. If we only ever sit on the sidelines, what difference is that going to make to the people around us? Our offence and unbelief are signs of our unwillingness to exercise our faith, to enter into and develop a, a real spiritual growth area. Now, I know people who are actually offended by God, they're mad at him. They've even turned away from him. Life's not turned it out turned out the way they were expected. They had no willing desire to move outside their comfort zones. I know a lot of people who over the years have been offended by, by God and what Jesus teaches. People turn their back on God for many reasons. Not just the hard teachings. For some, it's something that's happening in their life, a, a serious financial setback. Um, for others, it's a, a serious illness of their own or, or of a loved one, or a death, or, or an estranged relationship, a failed marriage. Other people look at the tragedies which occur around us, the natural ones and the man-made one, and, and ask, where is God when this is happening? How could God let these tragedies happen. Now these feelings, they're natural and understandable and completely normal. Sometimes it seems like God is hidden or far away or even absent. It's not easy to follow God and we shouldn't pretend it is. The way of God is often hard, 
But in the end, I believe it's actually easier to believe in and follow God than not following him. Faith makes sense to me. When, faith, when faced with being offended and angry at God and, and the barriers that, that seem impossible to get over, we've come to a place, well, we have to come to a place that Peter came to. When Jesus asked the twelve, you don't want to leave either, do you? And Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, who are we like? Are we like the people in the crowd who, when faced with difficult and uncomfortable teachings or situations, turn our back on God? Are we fans who sit on the sidelines and, and cheer only to forget about Jesus until next Sunday? Or are we followers willing to roll up our sleeves and love our neighbour and serve God? It's all right to be angry with God. Just look at the, the psalmists. They cry out to God. But we have to remember God loves us so much that he came to earth as Jesus. Not to judge, but to fix our relationship with him. In response to all that love and grace freely given to us, we have to respond by loving God back with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength and with all our mind. And we need to love our neighbour as ourselves and share our faith making disciples who make disciples. That's the gospel. That's as simple and as hard as it is. Jesus wants to know that what will happen to our faith when things will get tough. He wants to know that we won't turn away from him. He wants to know what will happen if we don't understand something he asks us to do. Will we say, wow, this is just too hard, and turn our back on him? Are we fans, or are we committed followers of Christ? They're the questions I'll leave with you this Sunday. Let's pray. Loving God, give us the wisdom to discern the way you want us to go. Give us the strength to, to hold on tight to you when things get tough, when we don't understand what you're asking us to do. Let us be obedient and follow you anyway. Lord, let us know that you have a plan that is greater than our, our human minds can, can fathom. And give us the courage, the strength, and the wisdom to follow that plan. Amen.